Have you ever been in a dark place? Maybe a deep pit that you just can't climb out of? What's going through your mind? How do you handle that situation? Do you try to do everything that you can on your own? Figure it out yourself? Do you carry your own torch? Or do you put your trust in God? In our world today, we got a lot of things going on, a lot of problems, a lot of concerns, a lot of troubles, a lot of chaos. And our world tries to handle the problems themselves. They try to solve all their issues themselves. In our lesson today, we're going to meet a people who are in a dark place. God's going to give them two options. You can handle it yourself or you can trust me. Isaiah is going to lay out what happens when you trust God in a dark place. What you have to look forward to when you trust God in a dark place. And what will happen to you when you start trusting yourself instead of God in a dark place. Stay tuned for this week's lesson. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to hear from God. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for this Sunday, June the 26th, 2022. The title of this lesson is God Delivers His People. God Delivers His People. We will look at Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 8. Before we get started, please, if you like this lesson the lesson blesses you hit the like button hit the share button and if you're not a subscriber please hit the subscriber button thank you so much in advance and if god leads you please leave a comment in the comment section i always love to hear from you thank you so much in advance let's get into our lesson as you know for the past several weeks we have talked about isaiah uh, we should know pretty much about him now he's a major prophet as relates to his content that he produces. Uh, he is an 8th century prophet. He prophesies in the 700s. Uh, he is, in our lesson today, and in our lesson we've been talking about, he's preaching to a group of people that will be living 150 years from his current setting. Those people will find himself, themselves in captivity under Babylonian rule. They would have experienced Hardship, uh, destruction, war, famine. Uh, they'll have their culture stripped from them. Uh, they'll have their faith tested. Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem, was left uh, by Babylon in rumbles. The Solomon's temple was torn down. Uh, no rock was unturned. It was burned. The area was burned. Uh, most of most of the people were taken out of. It's the southern kingdom of Israel. Northern kingdom by this time has been destroyed for quite a bit of time. But the Babylonians took people out, all the best people, all the people that could benefit them in some kind of way, they took them back to Babylon. And what was left uh, was just people left, very poor people, people in poverty, left to try to do something with the land was there, but they could not. It was decimated that much. So Isaiah is writing to these people that will be living during this time, in this captivity, during the 70 years of captivity in Babylon, and he's trying to encourage them. And one of the things that we know that this captivity was a direct result of their disobedience, their idol worship, their empty worship, their uh, just going, listen to trusting other nations and trusting men instead of God, ignoring what the prophets had to say, which was a word from God. And God had enough. Uh, he, they saw what happened to their big brother uh, in the northern kingdom. That did not deter them. 
and it just kept having evil king after evil king after evil king. And God finally said, it's enough. So they are in despair. Uh, they look, feel as though their future is hopeless. They don't know what to think. They don't know. They want to, they, they feel God has maybe left them and they're alone. Uh, they're in a very difficult spot and it's to their own doing. As we come to 51, we've been talking about a servant and this servant is Jesus Christ that will suffer for them. And so what Isaiah has said to them as we come to 51, uh, you're in this position because of your sins. But there's a suffering servant that will come and, and die not for uh, his sins, but he's going to die for your sins. And so in verse 10 and 11 of chapter 50, he gives them really an ultimatum. And it's like, who are you going to choose? And it says, who among you fear the Lord and obeys the voice of the servants? Uh, you know what this servant is going to do. You know he's going to reconcile, rectify everything. You know your hope is in him. Who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust this servant or are you going to trust man? It said, let him who walk in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord. Isaiah, uh, through the words of God, is encouraging them in their difficult time, in their dark time, to trust in the Lord. Put their faith in him. He says, uh, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Rely on the servant's God. And then 11 says, he gives them a, another alternative. Behold, all of you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches. Meaning that those who trust in themselves, uh, walk by the light of your fire, and by the torches which you have kindled, this you will have from my hand, and you shall lie down in torment. Isaiah gives them a warning. If you're going to ignore this servant and all that he's done, if you're going to reject him by not trusting in him, then guess what? Uh, in the end, you're going to lay down in your torment. So he's encouraged them to make a choice. And so as we come to 51, he's going to give the uh, benefits or the incentives of trusting in the Lord. Now the key is that we have to understand in 51, it's for those who, Isaiah is speaking to those who trust in the Lord. If you don't trust in the Lord, this does not apply to you. If you don't trust in the Lord, you cannot expect these things to happen to you. Remember, if, you tr if you're trusting yourself, you carry your own torch, all you can expect is to lay down in torment. But right now, Isaiah, God speaking through him, is going to issue words of comfort to Jerusalem, to those who trust in him. So let's get into it right now. Listen to me. This is an imperative. Listen to me. I have something important to say. Listen to me. It's your benefit. Listen to me and no one else. This is what Isaiah starts off with. You who pursue righteousness. I'm talking to those who pursue righteousness, not their own righteousness, not their own good works, not trying to make them look good or look good on the outside, but those who pursue the righteousness of God, meaning they seek to do the ways of God. They want to obey God's commandments. They want to uh, be obedient to God and live the life that he wants them to live. And so we ought to be pursuers of righteousness. And so this is who Isaiah is talking about. He's very clear. Those who pursue righteousness, those who want to do right by God, those who want to please God, those who want to fulfill the plan that God has for their lives. So those who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord, okay? Those, you who seek the Lord speaks of a relationship with God. Not only are you pursuing what is right, but you're seeking or wanting or cultivating that relationship with God on an ongoing basis. So those who are righteous, look at this, seek the Lord, okay? Those who are righteous seek the Lord. They want to have an intimate relationship with God. They want it to be deeper and deeper and deeper. And the more they seek the Lord, the more they can pursue his righteousness, the more they know his ways. And that ought to tell us, what, what does God want for us? He wants us to pursue righteousness. Not what we think is right, but what he says is right. Based on his character, based on what we know about God, we ought to pursue his 
righteousness. And a lot of times what troubles me a little bit is that we live in a world today where we have many professing Christians. And I'm not saying whether they are or not, only God knows. But sometimes when the pedal hits the metal or when the rock hits the road, when they're in a tough spot, they disavow or go against maybe what God wants them to do, his righteousness. They put our trust in something else or we believe in something that is immoral that goes directly against God. And we got to be careful that even in the darkest places, and this is what he's writing to, people who are in a dark place, in a hopeless place, who are in captivity, who don't really know what their future holds for them. And he's telling them to pursue righteousness in that spot. And when we find ourselves in whatever dark spot we are, we have got to seek the Lord. We have got to pursue the ways of God and not try to do things our own way. So it says here, it says, listen to me, to who you who pursue righteousness and you who seek the Lord. This is his audience. It says, look to the rock from which you were sown. Look for the rock in which you were cut off at. And then it says, and the quarry, that's the big hole in which you were dug out of. Look at your history, Jerusalem. Look at your history, Israel. Look what God has done in your life. You started off small. You started off as a piece of a rock. You started off in a, in a hole, in a pit with no expectations. And look what God has done for you. God has made you a great nation. When you're in a dark spot, when you're in a dark place, what Isaiah is saying here, what God is saying to him, look to your history, look to your past, and see what God has done. See, look at the history and see how God has delivered you out of place, out of place, out of place, and look to where he has brought you. Even though in a dark spot, God has done, in the past has done miraculous things for the nation of Israel, for Zion, for Jerusalem. And what he's saying is look to your past, draw your strength, draw comfort and knowing what God has done in the past, he will do in the future. And he gives an example, a powerful example. And one thing I like about God and what he does in history, he uses uh, people that we would not use, that man would not use, insignificant people, maybe sinful people, maybe corrupt people, or maybe ordinary people, or people that just you would not even use, and he takes them and uses great things, brings them to a high point. He takes a shepherd boy like David, uh, the least picked out of his brothers to defeat Goliath, to become king, to be, do something great. And he takes this shepherd boy at a young age at 16, anoints him, and he does great things through him. Even though David sins and falls short and does all these things, Guess what he does? He uses them anyway to accomplish his great work. Takes a person like Paul, a person who hunt down Christians, who wanted to destroy the church, who was, God wanted him to go this way. He was going that way. They're going the opposite direction of God. God meets him on the Damascus Road. He becomes saved, and God uses him to be a gospel globetrotter in the New Testament, to write over half of the New Testament, to, to plant many churches, bring many people to salvation. God can use the most obscure person to accomplish the good work. And he uses an example here. Look to Abraham, your father, the father of the faith. Okay? Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was the founder of the Jewish people. And Sarah, who bore you, look to Abraham and Sarah. And what we know when we say Abraham and Sarah together, God had promised them that they would have a child. And God would promise that they would have a son. And through this son, his legacy, people, his, his legacy will be multiplied. His offspring would be multiplied, meaning that so much so that it would outnumber the stars in the sky and the sands in the sea. And he's not talking about maybe a physical offspring. He's talking about a spiritual offspring, Jews and Gentiles because of the becoming to Christ and they become his spiritual offspring. And so he said, look right here. Uh, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him. When God called uh, Abraham out of the early Candies, when he 
Chaldees, when he called him, he was just one person. When Israel began, it began with one person. But through that one person, and through Sarah, his wife, a child was born. And that out of that child being born, Israel becomes a great nation. The, in, no one saw this coming. No one could believe it. Remember, God takes the most likely person. Abraham was 100. Sarah was 90 when Isaac was born. Well past childbearing ages. Many people counted them out, and rightly so. Who has a baby or has a child at 90 years old? Who has a child and becomes a father at 100 years old? Just doesn't happen. But God made an example, chose him as an act of faith, as something that he can do to be an encouragement to other people. So, for he was not but one, for he was but one when I called him, that I may bless him. Okay, an example of a blessing and multiply him. God multiplied him beyond his imagination. And what God is saying to people in the dark places, to these captives in Babylon, what he's saying to you and I, when we find ourselves in dark places, if I can take Abraham from one person, one man, and make a great nation out of him, I can surely take you out of this dark place and, and be a blessing to you and do great things to you. That's what he's saying. So Abraham and Sarah ought to be an encouragement. You look past your history and see what God has done in your life. That ought to be an encouragement in dark places. And one thing I like about this lesson here is that the Babylons were in the, the excuse me, the Jews in Babylon were in this position because of something that they did of their evil doing. It wasn't happenstance. It wasn't uh, something that they found themselves like in slavery in, in uh, Egypt that they caused, did that cause it at all. They caused this. This was an act of punishment for them. And yet God does not leave them in their judgment. God brings is going to send a servant that's going to deliver them and God's not done with them and God's going to bless them and do great things. What does that say for you and me? When we fail, when we fall, when we sin, when, and then when we come out of it and repent, because these people are, have repented, these, this nation is repenting, or when we pursue righteousness, God will, God still can use us to do great things. He's not finished with us. Okay, so he wants these captives to know that I'm not done with you. And that brings great comfort to them. And that brings great comfort to us. Even though we mess up, when we repent and we pursue righteousness and when we seek the Lord, God can still use us and he will use us. It says, for the Lord comforts Zion. Zion is Jerusalem. It's the kingdom. It has a kingdom context. Okay, and this passage here is another verses one through four is another uh, servant song, and this whole thing right here I, I want to let you know is that this this is dealing with eschatology. It's dealing with end times. The people here that Isaiah is speaking to, prophesizing 150 years into the future, they're not going to experience this in this lifetime, but they will experience this in the end times when Christ returns. And sometimes when we find ourselves in difficult places and we may not get out of it, I can't promise you that you're gonna be free completely from that dark place in your lifetime. You may have to struggle, but God will be there with you in your struggle. But in the end time, when Christ returns, you will be free. You will be set free. There will be blessings there waiting for you the key is, in the midst of your trouble, uh, pursue righteousness and seek the Lord, and the blessing will come. That will give you strength to endure all that you have to endure, keeping your eyes on the prize, keeping your eyes on the Lord. And God says, it will not, we talked about this last time, if your pursuing and your seeking will not be in vain. In the end, those who pursue righteousness those who seek the Lord will not be disappointed. Your hope and your faith will not be in vain. And that's, that's comforting. So this has an eschatological, eschatology, eschatology or eschatological uh, note, meaning that this is dealing with the end time. Okay, so 
For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places. These waste places that you know that you that, that you came out of, and that you know that was destroyed by Babylon, that you know that exists in Zion, in Jerusalem. God's going to deal with that. He said he and makes her, he's going to make her wilderness, that desert-like place, that waste place, like Eden. Remember the Garden of Eden? Just so fruitful. So uh, uh, the best place to live. Uh, when Adam and Eve were in Eden, they were in right relationship with God. They had plenty of growth. It was no barren spot around. It was no wasteland. What God says in the end times, uh, you in this land, this Jerusalem, when I come back and I create this new earth, okay, it's going to be like Eden. And you're going to be in a right relationship with me, and it will be no wasteland. It will be just trees. It will be nothing but fruitful produce, fruitful vegetation. Uh, it will be beyond your imagination. It says, and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. This desert that you see will cease to exist. It will be no more when the Lord, when you, the servant returns, when Christ returns, it will be no more because it will be the garden of God. If it's the garden of the Lord, guess what? You know it's a magnificent place. So the comfort is, is that what you see now is not always going to be this way. What you see now, there are better things to come, especially when that servant returns. That's what God is saying here. And that's an encouragement. That's an encouragement that people who are in despair, okay? It gives them hope. And one thing I like about liking it to the slaves of my ancestors is that a lot of them were not free. Many of them were not free. But yet, God tells them that, uh, and their faith, and what got them through the situation was their faith in God. And they had to know that, okay, I may not experience all these blessings now, but the good news is that I will experience it in the future. And the good news is that my generation, my offspring, generation after generation, one day they will no longer be in slavery. And one day they too will experience the goodness of God. And that gives you a lot of hope to endure terrible hardship. I often wonder, how did they do it? It had to be their faith in God. It had to be their hope in God. It had to be knowing that God has something better for them and something was better to come. Maybe not in their lifetime, but in, in the time when Jesus will come back for the second time. All right, let's see what's happening here. It says here, and it says, her desert will be like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Jerusalem will sing and rejoice at the goodness and the blessings of God. They will see all of what God has done and it will, it will create an outburst of song, of rejoicing, and thank goodness and gladness. God will do a great work, and people will respond to that great work with gladness, rejoicing, and with song and thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. And we have to ask ourselves that when God brings us out of a dark place, how do we respond? When we've been out of a job for a long time and we get a good job, how do we respond? When we've been in a terrible relationship and God frees us from that relationship or reconciles that relationship, how do we respond? Do we respond with gladness and thanksgiving and obedience and with a voice of song? Uh, it, it ought to be a natural overflow of God blessing us. Let's look at verse 4. Give attention to me, my people. This is another imperative. The first one was, listen to me. Now give attention. Say the same thing, but maybe a little bit stronger. Give attention to me, my people. I mean, meaning that pay attention to me about what I'm going to do. Give attention to me, my people, and give an ear to me, my nation. He's talking to Israel. My people, Israel, give attention to me. Give a listening ear to me, my nation. For a law, meaning that I'm going to send out a law, will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. What he's saying is that I'm, I'm in the, toward the end, the gospel's going to go out, or I'm going to make known what my ways are, or what I expect on living on to be look like, or I'm going to send some instruction and teachings out when uh, toward in the in the eschatological time. 
period, time period. And he says that I'm going to do that. He says, and a law will go out from me and I will set my justice. Meaning that the law is going to be a law of justice, of fairness, of righting wrongs and rewarding rights. It's going to be a justice for a light to the peoples. His instruction, his teaching, what's going to go out, this law that's going to go out. It's going to be so magnificent that it's going to draw peoples to him, nations to him. Not only Israel, they're going to be in need of this instruction, but the rest of the world is going to respond to this law, to the set of instructions, to the, to the expectations of God, to the way you ought to live. They're going to respond to it, to the justice of God. He says, uh, my righteousness draws near. Mean that my 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 what I expect of you draws near. My sending of my son draws near. My salvation has gone out, meaning that uh, I have sent out salvation. The gospel has gone out, and my arms of justice will judge the peoples. So my righteousness draws near, and God's righteousness deals with salvation being sent out, but also it also has a a twin of judgment, his arm of judgment, judgment is there also. He says, my arms will judge the peoples, okay? So those who uh, accept Christ, those who accept God's way, they will be saved. Those who do not will experience the judgment of God. And that's how, that's how life is. Uh, God has sent his son to die on the cross for us, a suffering servant, we have a choice. Salvation has gone out. Justice has gone out. You have a decision to make. Do I accept salvation through Jesus Christ and avoid judgment? Or do I try to burn my own torch, light my own flame, and lie in torment, torment and suffer the consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ and being under judgment? He says, uh, the coastlands hope for me. This salvation, this judgment will hit the smallest of islands, the smallest of nations, as well as the largest of nations. And it says the coastland hope for me. They're waiting for this salvation to come. They're waiting for this justice to come. And they wait expectantly for the Lord, expecting to get something from the Lord. It says, and for my arm they wait. They also wait for justice to become, for God to right the wrongs. So God is going to set out the salvation, the judgment, and the people are going to receive it. They are anticipating it. They are waiting on God to do something. And when God does it, they're going to embrace and respond to it completely through salvation. And then he said, this is a, then in verse 6, another imperative. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Another imperative. Look to the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. And the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. God's going to put an end. He said, part of my, my your hope is, part of me comfort to you is, this earth as you know it will come to an end. All the evil in this earth will come to an end. All the evil people in this earth will come to an end. And God's going to make a new heaven, a new earth. And there will be a new people, a people that those people who have pursued righteousness, those who have sought God, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior will indwell in this new heaven and this new earth. And God said, what you see, this earth that you see, you look up, the heavens that you see, you look up and you think it will always be there. Guess what? It will come to an end. This earth that you see, that you think that will always be here. God said it will, it will waste away. God's going to take this earth and he's going to rejuvenate this earth and make it into a new earth. So God gives them comfort. And he says this evil earth that you see and the evil people that you see it will be no more. This uh, 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 heavens will vanish like a smoke. I mean, it'll be gone in a minute. And the earth will wear out like a garment. It will wear out like the clothes you wear. It will be gone. It will wear out in a moment. And those who dwell in it will die in the same way. They will go out a bit of smoke. They will die 
they will be no more. So God will put an end to all this chaos here and make it anew again the way uh, it will be a blessing to us. All right, let's see what we got. It says, but my salvation will be forever. Okay, in other words, even though the earth will waste away, even though the heavens will go up in smoke, if you, if you put your trust in them, you will die with them. You will die with heaven and earth. That's where your trust is. And you say, I will make my heaven here on earth. Guess what? You will suffer the same faith. But if you put your trust in God, that's what it says right here. But my salvation will be forever. If you put my trust in God and his ability to save, and you pursue righteousness and seek the Lord, guess what? You have eternal life. You will live forever. You will not perish. You, it says here, and my righteousness will never be disdained, but my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be disdained. My righteousness, my right way, uh, my plan will not be shattered, okay? Will that, despite all the opposition, despite this evil world, my salvation will prevail. My ability to save will prevail. You need to come on board. This ought to give you comfort. And my righteousness, my right way, will not be shattered. In other words, you can trust me. In other words, put your trust in me. Don't put your trust in man. Don't put your trust in the earth. Put your trust in me. You will not be disappointed. Okay? Verse 7. Listen to me, you who know righteousness. Nothing imperative. Listen to me. You who know my ways. You know who, what is right and what's wrong. You who seek after me. You who pursue my righteousness. You who know my righteousness is true and just. The people in whose heart is my law. Those who have come to accept Christ. Who put their trust in God. Who know that in their heart that what God says is right, it is the right thing. Fear not the reproach of man. Those who are committed to, to serving God, those who are committed to living out God's life, those who have said, I will die for Christ, those who said, I am sold out for Christ, those who says, and they believe Christ not only outwardly, but they believe God and his righteousness in their hearts. Guess what? Fear not the reproach of man. As you, he's talking to them. Uh, and he's talking to, to anybody, any age really. And he says this, uh, when you come to me, when you pursue God's righteousness, when you seek after the Lord, there will be people who will insult you, who will ridicule you, who will mock you, who will try to discourage you, who will oppress you, who will create acts of violence against you. He says, he says, fear not the reproach of man. Don't be terrified of the reproach of man. Don't worry about the insults. Nor be dismayed at their revealing. Don't, don't get caught up in their negativity, in the words they say, how evil they are. Don't get caught up in that. Stay on the prize. Stay faithful to God. Trust him. He says, this, this is what's going to happen to them. For the moth will eat them up like a garment. Okay? The moth, boy, if you ever seen a moth, it will put holes in it. Make them ineffective. Make them waste away. Make them go away. And the worm will eat them like wood. The worm wood. They will, the worm will come into the wood and just put holes in it and destroy them. So don't worry about the reproach. It will come. It has to come. But don't worry about it. I got that covered. You just trusted me. While you're in this dark place, while you're uh, in this place of, of darkness, just trust me. And then it says, but my righteousness will be forever. Why, why do you trust me? Because my righteousness will be for My goodness will be forever. My right way of doing things will be forever. Your right standing with me will be forever. However you want to look at righteousness, it will be forever. And my salvation to all generations, my salvation, my ability to save, my saving you 
will not go away. It, it's eternal. It lasts forever to all generations. All generations will have the opportunity or can experience my salvation. What is God saying to here? You can count on me. My salvation will not be destroyed. My plan of salvation will not go away. It will outlast the earth. It will outlast the heavens. It will outlast the evildoers. It will outlast everything. It is worthy of your trust. It cannot be destroyed. God will keep his promises. God's promises cannot be thwarted. Okay. And so what God is saying is this. I want to give you hope in dark places. No, I may, I may have to leave you there. No, you may not escape this dark place. But in the midst of this dark place, you can change your attitude. You can deal with it by putting your trust in me. By pursuing righteousness, by living righteously, no matter where you are. By seeking God, no matter what condition that you're in, no matter what your circumstances are. God is saying, seek me, trust me. That's where you'll find your comfort. I have plans for you. Your future is great. Your future, you will not be disappointed in the end. And don't let naysayers discourage you. Don't let naysayers discourage you. So I hope this lesson has been a benefit to you. I hope that you can identify, and not to maybe to that extent, of the people that will find themselves in captivity. But maybe you have an illness, and maybe that's your dark place. Maybe your finances is your dark place. Maybe your marriage, your relationships are your dark place. Your family, your children, maybe that's your dark place. Maybe losing a loved one is your dark place. Maybe this whole living in this world and seeing all this evil around us, maybe that's your dark place. What God is saying is listen to him. Give attention to what I got to say. Listen to me. Look to me. All these imperatives are giving, telling us to focus on God and what God has to say and what God is doing in your life. That will set you free. God delivers his people. He does it. He may not do it physically. In the end, he will. But he definitely does it spiritually. May God bless you. Love you much. Thank you for joining me. Remember to leave a comment in the comment section. Guess what? I'll see you next week. Have a great Sunday. Have a great Sunday school. Love you much.